Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We've got a great show for you today. We've driven some really interesting vehicles, uh, but joining me right away here is consumer editor Jeremy Korsniewski. What's going on, man? Hey, not doing too, too bad. How are you doing? Not bad, not bad. It's Thursday morning. Um, weather's pretty nice. A uh, good day to talk some cars. Yes, it I, is. Uh, it is, right? Um, it is. Spent some time with the Hyundai Veloster N, which is a pretty interesting hot hatch. Uh, 275 horsepower from a Hyundai Veloster. We'll get into that. Jeremy did a first drive of the Jeep Gladiator Mojave. Uh, pretty interesting. He teased this out a few weeks back, but now his full story is up. So we're get, going to get into that just a little bit more. Uh, I saw this vehicle at the Chicago Auto Show, and I was really excited by it. So uh, I'm excited to hear what you think, Jeremy. And uh, yeah, we'll break out down some of the news of the day. There's a new 4 Series Nissan Plus strategy. It kind of sounds like an energy drink or something. <laughs> uh, and then we have uh, Jeremy kind of did some reporting uh, based on consumer reports about what engines are most likely to give you trouble and most likely to blow up, if you will. Finally, we have an interview with Frank Meekum of Meekum Auctions. We're going to talk about some of the very cool Shelby Mustangs that he has coming up for sale in July, and then just what it's like to try to hold an auction in the age of coronavirus. So let's jump right in. The Hyundai Veloster N. I just drove this uh, yesterday. I uh, uh, drove it, uh, you know, for quite a bit, actually. Had some fun with it. It's a, it's a really good-looking car. Uh, start off with the fact that when you look at it, I think sort of the end treatment does so much for it. And then when you look at the coloring, this is called performance blue. You almost have to do a double take to make sure that you're like, oh, right, this is a Veloster. The Veloster, I think, is an interesting car. You know, they try to like, you know, it's, it's curious in some ways that Hyundai tries to play in the hatch space. Right now, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure it's a place everybody has to be but they're there so good for them you know let's let's do that um and the veloster is like the really the spicy hatch if you will 275 horsepower uh, it's got 19 inch alloy wheels um it's on summer tires so it's kind of kind of cool there's actually a little warning on there say don't drive these in the snow or icy conditions mm. uh which is okay pretty literal uh it's got the the, the special diff on it they actually call it the end corner carving differential, which is a limited slip with electronic controls, as I try to read that precisely. So that's impressive, actually. I mean, even on some of the other sort of medium to hot hatches, you don't necessarily get that kind of uh, equipment, which I think is cool. Uh, it's got the big brakes. These are 13.5 inch front rotors. Uh, in the back, they're 12.4 inch. Uh, and mine stickered for $30,430. Hmm. It's a little bit more than the Corolla I drove last week, which I called a medium spicy hatch. This is definitely a true spicy hatch. That's for sure. It's powerful. It's, um, it's a little rough to drive. I think the, uh, the chassis is definitely calibrated for performance. I was thinking, I'm like, man, I would like to get this thing on a track. I mm -hmm. think, uh, it's interesting when you drive a car, the cars that you start to think, hey, I would, I would like to get this one on a track. You know, it's not always the craziest, most expensive, most powerful. It's the ones that you really think you get like a lot of response from and feel very engaged. And that's what I kept thinking. It's a little bit of a cliche to drive around the suburbs and say, oh man, I wish I could track this thing. But yeah, I mean, it's got a number of different driving modes. It's got a rev match feature, which actually surprised me. I was doing a I was doing a downshift and then it rev meshed and I was like already kind of getting on the throttle. Mm. And I'm like, <laughs> whoa, easy there, dude. You're going mm -hmm. to blow this thing up here. So be careful. Um, so it's definitely calibrated really for the true enthusiast, which I think is a great thing, especially in this day and age. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fun car to drive. I, I picked up my son's um, like clothing and art projects from school and, um, where we have not been since the lockdown and today mm. or yesterday was just like, Hey, go pick up your stuff guys. So we got a St. Patrick's day art project, which was, you know, kind of like going back in time and the teachers were like, Oh, Hey, that's, that's a cool car. We don't see many, you know, Hyundai Velosters that look like that or Hyundai Velosters really period in Metro Detroit. But, um, yeah, it was fun, man. I'd say the, 
the transmissions, you know, the, the six speed manual is definitely, it's a little raw, but it's definitely tuned mm -hmm. for performance. So I wouldn't downgrade it for that. I would just say it's a very, like, it wants you to get dialed in, you know, and frankly, mm -hmm. when I've literally driven two manuals now in the last like three months, just cause press cars have been spread out and it's been cold, frankly. So some of that might be my reflexes were a touch dull, but yeah, I mean, so that's my monologue on the Veloster, I guess. Bring you in here, Jeremy. I know you've driven Velocitors. You obviously didn't drive this one. Right. But, I mean, where do you kind of, where do you put the Veloster and specifically the Veloster N sort of in this, this segment? Well, I mean, it's, this is one of those weird cars to pigeonhole. Um, and that means almost by definition, I'm probably going to like it. Um, because, you know, it, anyone who's been following the automotive industry for, you know, the last several decades will see that cars and, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit in our bmw 4 series not to foreshadow too much but cars tend to fit into very uh specific buckets um and have a very specific competitive set and you can tell that the designers and engineers are aiming for specific um markets and segments of the automotive industry um, when they come out with a new vehicle or a new version of the vehicle the veloster is completely different from that um which i think is great um, and, and you can tell this is the kind of vehicle that, that I would be, uh, drawn to as the owner, the ex owner of a, um, Mazda RX-8. Um, again, another vehicle that's really difficult to pigeonhole. Um, I, I think of these as like basically, um, sports cars, uh, wrapped in a unique, unexpected package, specifically the N, which I haven't driven. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, totally trust my colleagues opinions um and and, and i've heard uh from joel stocksdale who did a drive on this and now from greg um that it's uh you know it's tuned extremely sporty um it's a legit like uh you know high-end civic uh high-end volkswagen gti competitor but it offers a lot of uniqueness um to, to go along with that, the strange, funky third, sh uh, third door, um, shape, which I think is great. Like, you know, that's, that's one of those things that no one else is doing. Um, if you don't think that you need the ultimate practicality of a four door hatchback, like a GTI, um, but you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into something truly, um, with, with no usable backseat or cargo area, like say, a Miata or a BRZ or a, or a Toyota 86. Um, this offers something that is extremely sporty, um, aimed at enthusiasts, uh, and, um, you know, competent, like track ready, track worthy, um, as Greg was alluding to. Um, so I think that's, that's great. And, and who would have expected Hyundai to be the brand that is, uh, kind of pushing into that, um, segment of the market with their N series. Um, and I'm really excited that the, the Veloster N is, um, cool and the right vehicle for them to launch with. Um, obviously its appeal is, um, is, you know, only to a subset of the industry or to, to the, to the marketplace. Um, it'll be really cool to see how they, um, parlay that N performance line into some of their more mainstream vehicles, um, something with a little bit more, you know, widespread appeal. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see where Hyundai goes with this whole N uh, performance line. So that's a great point you bring up about uh, Joel having driven this car. That's our news editor, Joel Stocksdale, uh, has a really nice review uh, from fairly recently, last fall, we ran it in October. Um, and one of the comparisons he sort of brings up is that this one comes in with this like performance package, if you will, which actually gives you a pretty good boost in horsepower. That's mm -hmm. worth noting. Stock, it's it has about 50 fewer horsepower, if you will. Um, whereas this one gets you to 275, which to me is a lot of horsepower for velocity. Yeah, it sure it's a, is. Mm -hmm. It's a hundred more horsepower than the Corolla I drove last week, which really was nothing special. But you know, it like I said, that was a medium spicy hatch more about dynamics than raw power. But a great point Joel makes is the Civic Type R is 37, uh, mm -hmm. and the Type R, or not the Type R, the Golf R is $41,000. Mm -hmm. So 
And like the horsepower difference is, you know, not that much. So, I mean, to me, that's like, obviously we sort of expect value from Hyundai, but you know, I don't know. I mean, if I'm an enthusiast and like, which I am, and I'm looking to get a good deal, like as much like bang for the buck, if you will. I mean, this is what you kind of look at. Now the trade-off is like type R. I mean, that's, that's a, it's still the type R, you know, like people, people I think are not going to necessarily, you know, look at this car in the same way as a civic type R. Let's put it that way. Now, on the other hand, you're paying, you know, 37 grand for a Honda Civic, you know, I mean, you got to really be a Honda, you know, fan person for that. And again, you're paying over 41 for a Golf, you know, I mean, granted, you do get the all wheel drive with that. Um, So there's just, there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Sure. Yeah. And and another, another kind of comparison that you can make is in styling and looks. Um, The Civic is a compact economy car a very good compact economy car. Uh, I don't fault anyone for choosing a Civic. I, I, I mean, the latest Civic is, is excellent. Um, but I don't like the way it looks. Like it's, it's, it's blocky, um, it's got fake vents all over it. And, um, and that's just like the, the base one. Um, I, I did the first drive on the hatchback, which would fall into that medium spicy um, uh, bucket like, like Greg was talking about. Um, and it's such a joy to drive, but it's painful to look at and, and no offense to civic owners out there. It's just, it's not my cup of tea from, from, you know, the outside. Then they have the type R, which is an absolute brilliant machine. Um, everything about the way that thing drives, um, is so good. But then I get out and I'm like, oh, I need a paper bag over my head because I'm walking away from this, you know, boy racer covered in wings, covered in weird slats. And like, it's, it's just not attractive. And, you know, looks are in the eye beholder. If you disagree, more power to you. Um, but in my opinion, it's, it's just like this. Um, it's too much. It's, it's overstyled. It's overdone. Whereas the Veloster N has just the right amount of, um, like style, especially in the blue color that we're talking about, which if you look at um, if you look at Joel's review, you'll see that blue color with the, um, with the cool black and, um, and red, uh, elements on it. Um, it looks just right. Like, okay, you can, you know, an enthusiast is going to see it instantly know what it is, but even if you're not an enthusiast, you'll see it and say, okay, that's like the cool version of this car, but it, it, it's not ostentatiously designed, um, which I think is a, a feather in its cap. I, I really like what Hyundai's done there. So I, I will disagree with you respectfully on the Civic. I think that's like basically the best looking car in segment. I really do. It's up there with the Mazda. And I think the Accord in its segment may be one of the best looking too. Um, I mean, all right, maybe the Mazda 3 is better looking than the Civic. But that's just because that car to me is so singularly like it's a gorgeous car, especially the hatch. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the to me the Veloster... First of all, it looks awesome. Like, I was so psyched to drive it. Um, it's one of those things I keep finding reasons to kind of go into my yard because it's parked out front. Like, take out the trash. Well, let's take on another thing of trash. Oh, take out the recycling bin just to look at the car, you know? Um, I Yeah, I do think it looks not quite as good as some of the more conventional ones. Like, to your point, Jeremy, it is a three-door hatch thing. Um, and I will tell you that hatch is not huge. Let's put it right. that way. There's not a lot of room back there. Um, you know what it reminds me of a little bit as far as its ethos is the Hyundai Genesis Coupe uh-huh. um, R-Type, I believe they called it, or R-Spec. R-spec that was yeah. like kind of the, like the really raw treatment they gave like uh, some of the, well, mainly the Genesis lineup at the time when they were Hyundais. Uh, mm-hmm. I guess I'm dating myself a little bit here. But I remember when they launched the Genesis Coupe, that was a, a big deal for them. And yeah, it was, it, was, it was so much better than the Tiburon, right? Like they, yeah. went from, they went from that to this really cool rear wheel drive, like legit um, yeah. kind of sporty car. And you could get the Coupe. I think the rawest example was the Coupe with the Turbo 4, with the manual, with the R-Spec trim. Even more than just like that, uh, I can't think of what they call their, the code name for their V6. 
which is a little more like almost like a meant to be a premium, you know, air quotes kind of powertrain feel. But um, yeah, I mean, the kind of sort of irrespective of nothing here, it's like, <laughs> it feels like, I guess what I'm trying to say is it feels like Hyundai kind of like parachutes into this segment and they, parachute's not the right word. It feels like they just keep trying in these uh-huh. segments, these performance segments. Now give them credit because the Genesis Coupe, they were not shy about talking about how this thing could stand up against the Mustang. And mm-hmm. none of the journalists thought that. Although 10 years ago, the Mustang wasn't the Mustang that it is now. So, you know, there was sort of a, like, you know, some daylight where you could try to run in there and maybe throw in something that's different and get some different customers. Uh, and it was so much better than the Tiburon that it was like, you know, just was amazing. Let me put it right. that way by comparison. Yeah, to your point, I mean, credit where credit's due. Um, Hyundai is is like this this brand that is plucky and uh, is is never going to give up. Like, they've got this attitude like, okay, I mean, that was better than the last one. What are we going to do to top it this time? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Veloster, I think, has always been kind of a cool car, especially when they put the turbo on it. Um, and then they offered it in that cool like matte black uh, finish. And you're like, okay, yeah, like you guys are, are, are getting there. And then they come out with the new Tiburon, or not Tiburon, the new uh, Veloster. And you're like, okay, not bad. And then they roll out this Type N and you're like, holy crap, Hyundai, like you are legit serious about this, aren't you? Um, and, and I mean, bringing in, what was his name, Beerman? Um, yeah, from, Albert Beerman. From, yeah, from BMW Byerman, M. Ryerman, something like that. I, yeah. I don't know how you pronounce his last yeah, name. Yeah, no, me neither. I've met him. Yeah. He's so legit. He is like... Right. He, yeah, I mean, he just, he really, I think, took Hyundai to a new level as far yeah. as performance. Which is great. I mean, more power to Hyundai. And, and, and I hope this is, um, I hope the end line turns into something super successful for them. I am going to do some more driving this thing this weekend. Maybe I'll have a few more thoughts um, on next week's show. But... Um, yeah, I just, it's a fun car. You know, it's the kind of thing that like summer comes around and we start to get these things in the press fleet. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is like, to me, is like the quintessential, like take like a, a hatch and go take it on like a road course or something and just, you know, really have some fun or something. So we'll leave it there. I guess what's the opposite of a small, you know, kind of hot hatch? How about a big Jeep pickup truck? <laughs> Specifically, I think what we want to really get into here is the Mojave trim, which is uh, what you had. Um, I'm intrigued. I mean, just high level. What'd you think? Well, I mean, it's 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 stupid fun. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I like the Gladiator in general. Um, regular listeners to the podcast will know that. Um, every once in a while, we have these questions like, "Yeah, but would you rather have a Wrangler?" Um, and I mean. Maybe I, I, I love the Wrangler, um, but I just, I love what the Gladiator offers. Um, it's got that, that great four door practicality. Um, it's got the wind in your hair, take the top off, take the doors off. Um, like, uh, just cool factor that the Wranglers had for years. And, and, and as an ex Wrangler owner, I can tell you that you know, taking the top off, taking the doors off completely changes your, your, your view of, of going for a drive. Like you just want to go for a drive because you like your car and you're like, okay, let's, let's do something cool. I'm going to hang my foot out the thing, you know, safety completely goes out the window and you're just like, yeah, this is like, this is like a cool elemental automotive experience. The Gladiator offers that same kind of experience with the um, additional practicality of uh, a, a usable pickup truck bed. Um, I mean, my, my biggest complaint with the Gladiator in general is just that it's it's real expensive. Um, and I wish that there was some sort of decontented model that, you know, they could come in with a low base price. Um, the Mojave is exactly not that. Um, it's at the very high end. It's the same price as a Rubicon. Um, so the kind of the way that the, the review that I wrote up um, split it is okay you want the ultimate rubic or you, excuse me you want the ultimate gladiator do you choose the rubicon or do you choose the mojave um it's like six one way half dozen the other um and i fell on the side of the mojave being the the greatest 
expression of the gladiator. And, and here's, I wouldn't feel the same way about the, the Wrangler. Um, and, and here's why. The gladiator is compromised for rock crawling by design. It's got this super long wheelbase. Um, that means that big boulders and whatnot, like you have to have rock sliders on a gladiator because you're going to be banging um, the underside of the vehicle because of that long wheelbase all the time. Um, if you're going to be rock crawling, you really need to be in a Wrangler, um, a two door specifically, but the four door Wrangler with its slightly longer wheelbase is still superior um, over, over, you know, rocky trails than the gladiator. So, what is the gladiator shape um, not compromised by or, or for um, high speed desert running? Um, and, you know, the, the, the question was, could Jeep make a credible Baja style vehicle with solid axles front and rear? That's the big question. Um, typically, a Baja style um, vehicle is going to have independent front suspension. Um, and that's kind of like the norm. That's what's come, you know, come to be expected. Um, and you know, a solid front axle is, is compromised, um, or we thought would be compromised in, in that kind of terrain. The reality is that it just isn't, um, Jeep engineers are extremely smart people. They know what they're doing. Um, and they've figured out with the suspension geometry, um, with the hardware, those Fox shocks, with the remote reservoirs, the hydraulic bump stops, um, the slightly raised suspension, softer springs in the rear, like they've done everything that they have to do to make this thing work. And it just does. Um, I, I really, really wanted to put this thing through um, a proper uh, off-road course with like whoop style jumps um, and you know like the big huge bangs that you'd get um, if you were driving through the desert and living in you know I used to live in Arizona in Phoenix and we had that kind of terrain literally everywhere um, I'm in central Ohio now and we we have access to that kind of terrain the coronavirus meant that all of the off-road parks near me are closed down um, so what I had to do was uh, go on a bunch of off-road Jeep forums, get recommendations from local people on the worst dirt roads within 100 miles of where I live. Um, and that's what I did. I mapped out a, um, uh, mapped out a route um, that would take me on city streets, highways, um, regular dirt roads, and then just awful dirt roads, um, which, you know, like, Roads and air quotes. You can't see me right now, but um, and, and that's the best thing that I could do to test it. Um, and you know, I basically just bombed down these things um, at you know, there's no posted speed limit on these roads, but you know, 35, 45 miles an hour, um, just to see what this thing was capable of. And and what what really stuck out to me was it doesn't it doesn't matter what the road looks like. Go as fast as you feel is is safe for you and the car's fine it's got this like it's it's more capable than than you are willing to test it um and you know that tells me that jeep has hit the nail on the head um they've they've made a gladiator that has all the practicality um and maybe a jeep quote unquote practicality it's got four doors um plenty of room for four um maybe even five passengers if you want the pickup truck bed. So, I mean, it's not an impractical vehicle. It's also fun in the summer, good in the winter with its four wheel drive. Um, so like, I don't know what's not to like about it other than the fact that it's stupid expensive. Um, my tester was $59,000, $59,750. Um, I would not want to spend that much on a gladiator. Um, but I, you know, the, the flip side of that is I, I did some comparison shopping. A Chevy Colorado ZR2 isn't far off, and it's even more if you add the Bison package to it. A Toyota Tacoma TRD Pro um, is, is right up there at that same uh, dollar amount. Um, I think the, the real potential segment killer could be the Ford Raptor. Um, you know, it's a, 
it's it's extraordinarily capable it's got this stupid powerful ecoboost twin turbo engine um and it's it's a an absolute blast to drive so and, and you can get them if you're if you're not su super judicious with your options list you can get them um i mean you could match a mojave's price with it that has a couple options on it if if it, you know if that's what you were deciding between the problem with the raptor is that the thing is just massive um, I was talking with another one of our editors, uh, Byron Hurd, and, you know, we, we were both saying we've parked full size pickup trucks in our driveways and, um, you can't even open the doors all the way in a driveway that's close to a house or a garage or something like that, because the truck is just so big. You almost are forced to street park it. If you don't have like a massive garage, the gladiator doesn't have that problem. Um, so if it's the right size vehicle for you. If that kind of Baja style running um, driving experience uh, appeals to you, um, it's an absolute awesome vehicle. The major question, would I buy one? Probably not. Like it's, it's so cool, but I just could not bring myself to spend that kind of money on a Gladiator. Um, I feel like most buyers probably would get 90% of the way there with, you know, say a Sport. Or if you want a few of the extra niceties, a Sport S, and you could get you could get a nice Gladiator with a few of the options that you want, and you're not going to feel like you're driving a penalty box. You could get it for forty five thousand dollars. That makes way more sense to me um, for the Gladiator than sixty sixty five thousand um, dollars for a Mojave. I think it's interesting when you start to talk about Jeep prices, and you know we've we've sort of you know had this discussion on multiple fronts. You know, I like to configure them as sort of like Jeeps, you know, rough, tough vehicles that are, you know, a lot of people can afford them depending on what trim, you know, you're willing to accept and how much equipment you're willing to accept. But another way to look at them is like truly premium vehicles that are expensive and you get a lot of the capability that you might get in say, you know, a Galanda wagon, you know, the Mercedes mm -hmm. G-Class that, you know, you don't have to pay that kind of a price for. And I think Jeep does have such a strong brand that there is a status with them. And, you know, again, it's, it's not a G class. It's not some of the truly Uber luxury, like sort of, you know, tank SUVs. But, um, I think you almost have to make that like concession that, Hey, I may have to pay half of that kind of price to get, you know, three quarters of the capability, maybe 65% of the brand, maybe more like 80% of the brand thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really like different images is what it is. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of cynically, part of me wonders how many people are ever going to use a Rubicon or a Mojave for like their intended purposes. Like it right. almost seems like sometimes, you know, Jeep makes these super capable vehicles and then people just want to get everything. So they're like, well, what's the top trim? Okay. Give me the Rubicon, you know? Right. And it's tempting to fall into that trap if you're a consumer, but I think you also want to be smart and buy what you need. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the reasons I probably wouldn't get a Rubicon, and I've done some off-roading in my life, is I'm not a huge um, rock climber. I don't enjoy right. doing that. I, I'm much more of a let's hit the trails, you know, maybe go through a little bit of water because that's fun. Mm -hmm. Go through the forest, be in nature, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when I look at how I'd spend my money, it's like, well, I don't think I'd want that. You know, I don't need right. that kind of capability. Why would I spend that kind of money? Um, and then when I look at the Mojave, it's like, well, I don't really need a desert runner either. So I'm essentially talking myself into more like, a, you know, an overland or a sport or something right. like that. And then optioning it up. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too, because I really fall in the middle of this sort of like Venn diagram, if you will, because I love how the rank, I love how both the Wrangler and the Gladiator look. Um, but practically I always kind of fall back to like, well, I think I like the Wrangler a little bit more, mm -hmm. especially the, like the most recent redesign. It seems like they really made it just like look even more like itself, if you will, like all the things that were like, maybe a little like, eh, it's like they cleaned up in a very subtle way. And then, you know, the gladiator, I just, when it comes right down to it for me, like hauling stuff and towing stuff, like I would 
the truck size would work for me, but I'd rather have the SUV capability you know, as sense. far as just putting stuff away. Yep. That's a, a, a legit valid viewpoint. Um, and, you know, we can move on from the, the yeah. Jeep segment here, but yeah. um, I often talk about, man, I wish that, you know, that, that there was a kind of a stripper base model that came in um, at, you know, cut $8,000 off the top of it somehow. Um, yeah. But I also go back to, again, you know, as an ex-Wrangler owner, um, take a look at what those real cheap Wranglers look like now. They're rust buckets. They they fell apart. The The trim pieces were terrible. The tops were, were almost impossible to get on and off. And, I, you know, anecdotally, I, I had a, a 1990 um, which was a YJ with the square headlights. And I was driving down the uh, um, expressway one day and my top was nearing the end of its life. And the thing literally uh, ripped itself from its little plastic slip in container oh, at the geez. front of the windshield. And suddenly I had a massive sunroof over my head. Um, and, you know, like those were kind of the concessions to owning those super cheap Wranglers back in the day. And nowadays, that kind of thing just doesn't fly. Um, I mean, could you imagine if they crash tested a YJ? Oh um, my gosh! I mean, it would it would be an absolute disaster, and everyone would be like, like, what is FCA? What is Jeep doing? Like, they can't make these death traps, and you know. So, I guess like the, the Wrangler and the Gladiator, like, we we just have to kind of as enthusiasts like be okay with the fact that this is this is what Jeep can do right now and they're still sticking true to their heritage, to their roots, um, and building vehicles that are awesome, that like enthusiasts love and want to buy. They cost what they cost. You know, like let's just be happy that they're still doing this. Um, so, you know, I, I don't I don't mean to be like a uh, armchair quarterback and point at Jeep and say like, oh, it's too expensive. I mean, it, it's like you said, it's a premium product. It is what it is. It's safe. It's reliable. It doesn't turn into a, uh, you know, a rusted out death trap after 10 years like like they used to. And I think that's reflected in the, the purchase price and even the resale value. Like they've hit a point where they're they're like these icons of the American market and, you know, like. It's, I guess I can sum it up. It's a Jeep thing you wouldn't understand. You know, like that's what they see on the, the bumper sticker and all those things. Um, so I'm happy yeah. that they're making it. I think that's a good, healthy approach, if you will. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think we can leave it there. How about we run some through some news? Let's do it. All right. You know, the 4 Series was one of the bigger news of the week. Um, I think a good place to start is that the 4 Series, how it stacks up against the A5 and the Mercedes C-Class. Those were, you know, I think it's natural competitors. Uh, let's see, Zach Palmer. That's what I was looking for, was the author of this story on our site. Um, and I mean, straight away, the looks, I think, is a great place to start. I mean, mm -hmm. like, really, the 4 Series, man, I mean, that grill is like, what do you think of the grill? Why don't we just start there in a very superficial way? But oh, what man, do I, I think? Don't know. What's that? Uh, what do I think? Yep. What do you think? Oh, I think it's terrible. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, gosh, I don't know. I get that they've got to do something different. Like they've got to stand out. They've, you know, they've, they've got this kidney grill as part of their heritage and how do you evolve the kidney and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I'm sorry, this is just ugly. Um, like, <clears throat> anytime that you have to design the rest of the car around a specific feature to make it not look like a caricature, you've you've gone too far. And that's the case with the um, four series. Like, look at the look at the way they had to style the hood and the way that they had to um, like put the, the BMW emblem down on the front fascia from its traditional spot in the hood, that, that fascia kind of like, it lifts up to meet the top arches of this kidney grill. Um, and I mean, I don't, like, I like different. I like things that stand out. I think that's great. I think that's cool. This is too much. It's just too big. It does not look like a sports car. 
I was I was joking um, with Joel Stocksdale, who who told me that he's kind of warming up to the grill. And actually, to be fair, I've seen a lot of internet commentary, even our own comment commenters, who are saying that they're warming up to it and they're kind of okay with it now. And and if that's the case, then then great. For me, um, it's it's just too much. Like I compared it to what's happening with full size heavy duty pickup trucks. Um, they keep getting bolder and bolder and bolder front ends and like a big, huge, heavy duty, you know, not not to fall on the, the cliche of, of manly. Um, I don't you know, I think that's a stupid, you know, a, a stupid adjective, um, but like bold in your face style, um, you know, like I make fun of it in big pickup trucks, too, but I, I get it like, you know bling the thing out, chrome it, and everyone's buying it. Is that really where we want to go with sporty coupes? Do we want them to be like in your face? Like the first thing you see when you look at this car is not its beautiful profile, dash, dash, dash to axle ratio, wide tires, wide haunches. The first thing you see and what everyone talks about is this grill. And to me, that's a design failure. Like you're going after something that you don't have to go. Like you make a, a beautiful, sporty sports coupe, not something that, that like all you can talk about is how strange and how over-designed this, this front end. And it's not just the grill, like look at the side openings, look at the weird smiley face that they put underneath it. Look at the way that you can't mount a license plate to the front of it in any sort of stylish way. And it's just, it's overwrought, it's overdesigned, and it's just too big. Yeah, I would be curious to see how it looks in real life. When we had an X7, I want to say, in the office with, you know, that pretty big grill, I found myself liking it, but I also was like, well, it's on this pretty big SUV. So again, that's where, like, I mean, SUVs, trucks, I think they have more of a creative license to be cartoonish. You talk about these like stylistic, like, you know, luxury and or performance coupes. It's like, well, what are you doing here? Look at what Mercedes is doing. Look at how clean the C-Class coupe is. It's a beautiful car. Uh, I think they're going to have a tough time, frankly, topping how gorgeous that car is in its current generation. Uh, the Audi, you know, that grill with the silver four rings. They're, it's beautiful. I mean, you know, every, those cars, they all just work together, whereas... Um, you know, like, kind of like you said, you know, you expressed the thought that the four series is a little discombobulated. I mean, I think in a vacuum, different pieces work. Okay. The headlights, like the back fender flares, you know, but then you just like, Whoa, you put it all together. And it's just, to me, it seems like a bit much, but I guess we'll see. I'll say mm -hmm. this, take the license plate off. And I think it looks a bit better. It almost looks old school, like something out of the the twenties or thirties with a grill that big that you needed to like literally drive all the air into the engines to keep your cars from catching on fire. So maybe, okay, sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'll say this. I think Mercedes is just doing a great job with its looks and mm -hmm. BMW is sort of kind of struggling to find an identity. It reminds me, I'll use a sports analogy. Uh, I went to Michigan state we have, I would argue, iconic football uniforms, green and white. Almost nobody else wears that color scheme. Very traditional. But every couple of years, we change them up slightly. And it's like, and then they inevitably go back to the traditional look from like the 20s, 30s, 50s, whatever. But they always try to tweak them. And I feel like, like, don't do that, guys. Like, Notre Dame doesn't tweak their uniforms ever. Why do we do it? And I feel like BMW is kind of like that. You know, they like, they keep making these changes and it's like, you know what? I feel like your cars look worse than when I got into this business, you know? And I don't think that's what you should be going for. Mm. So I think we can move on from that. Check out the full rundown. Um, Zach Palmer, believe it or not, talks about other things than how the cars look. Uh, <laughs> the, the car stacks up quite well under the hood. It has the most torque in class. Uh, it's tied with the Mercedes for most horsepower at 255, uh, eight speed automatic. I mean, there's a variety of different options as far as mm -hmm. the upgrades, uh, which you should look at no word on like, you know, what the M model will, you know, potentially look like, but yeah, I mean, read his breakdown, you know, really gets literally under the hood and talks about some of the interior in ways you can look at this beyond just how it looks on the outside.
Um, <clears throat> let's talk about Nissan's plus strategy, if you will, for Infinity or the Infinity's strategy of Nissan Plus. Uh, this is actually another Zach Palmer um, byline. And check it out again on the site. We put this up uh, earlier this week. It, it really speaks, I think, to sort of the existential crisis that Infinity sometimes finds itself in. Frankly, oftentimes it finds itself in. Um, Zach points out that Infinity sales were down 21% last year. And last year was a really good sales market. So who knows what they're going to look like this year. Um, it's going to be tricky. Automotive News did a piece on this earlier this week where they kind of talked about the way forward. Um, check out the story again. But I'm just curious, Jeremy, where do you put Infinity right now? What, what are they doing? Do you think they have a good path forward? What do you think? Um. Okay, so Infinity is one of one of those companies that has had so many ups and downs over the years that this is just par for the course, to, in my view. Um, they started off really strong with the Q45, um, which was, you know, it, I mean, it didn't like set the sales world on fire and no one looks back at the Q45 like they look back at the Lexus LS series as being like this pinnacle benchmark um, of you know, taking the Germans and taking them to task and beating their own game. Um, Infinity just doesn't have that, that kind of reputation. Um, and, and I think that's part of, part of the problem. Um, they're, they're not Lexus. Um, they, they, they don't sit at the top of, um, at, of the class in pretty much any category. Um, like I look at their, their current, um, lineup, um, the Q50, Q60, um, they're, I mean, their, their coupes look, look really beautiful. Like if, if you just see it parked in, you know, I, I had a tester not that long ago. It was, um, this gorgeous shade of deep red, um, tons of power, uh, refined driving experience, like so many good things about it. But, but what is infinity? Like, like Lexus, you can say is, you know, I, I mean, I, I hate to, to jump on the marketing speak, but, you know, the the relentless suit of perfection or the passionate pursuit of perfection, whatever they're saying, th that is what they're going for. And it feels like it behind the car. They're going for an absolute perfect luxury experience. And you get that. What is Infinity going after? Like, le even with Acura, which which has also kind of lost its way over the years, um, you know, they're they're kind of like sportier and and high tech um and with that like cutting edge honda engineering what's infinity um it i mean nissan plus like maybe that's just a better route they they they've gone on their own with their unique platforms with the rear wheel drive vehicles the initial g um like was a benchmark car but what have they done since then? Like no one thinks fondly back on the M35 or M45. Um, no one has like, oh, my, you know, my family owned a, um, an FX35 or an XX, FX45 when I was growing up. And I just loved that car and I want to get another one or something. Like they just don't have that following, that reputation. And if they're going to stay in business, maybe this Nissan plus arrangement, which to be clear, let's define that. What they're talking about is not having a bunch of their own platforms, their own engines necessarily, their own, you know, complete unique vehicle. They're talking about basing them on a platform that's shared with Nissan, maybe even Renault. Um, and I mean, not likely, but maybe even Mitsubishi in certain markets, but they're going to take these platforms that already exist and they're going to pump them up and make them in infinities, um, you know, through through tuning and, you know, a little bit more technology, nicer interiors, that kind of thing. Maybe that's what infinity needs to be. Maybe it needs to be Nissan Plus for it to survive and for it to actually make an impact and be like something that potentially customers are going to look at and say like, yeah, this is the one that I want. Like I specifically want that car. I'm not buying it because it's a great deal. Um, I'm buying it because it's beautiful. It's full of the tech that I want. And you know, like 
I, I guess it just remains to be seen. Can they take this idea of Nissan Plus and make it differentiated enough because you don't want a Buick Olds Pontiac um, scenario like you had, you know, through a lot of the 80s and 90s with General Motors. You don't want, you know, the Oldsmobile to be the slightly more luxurious version of, you know, the, the Cutlass, the slightly lu more luxurious version of the Grand Prix and the LeSabre is the most luxurious version of all. Like, that's not going to fly. Um, so hopefully they can make it differentiated enough and, you know, make Infinity actually matter. What I think is interesting to your point, I mean, you literally said this right off the top. You were like, what do they stand for? And my first thought was I should answer, I don't know, and end the segment. Um, just, you know, because it's, it's such a tricky um, thing for them. I think they could win with Nissan Plus for sure. Uh, also in our story, we note that, you know, there could be some electrification. I think that could definitely help. I think electrification could be the great equalizer as far as mm -hmm. brands. It could really get you to a place where, um, who knows? I mean, even if they are just rebadged Nissans, if they're hybrids or electrics, well, that fills a niche that, you know, meets some needs that gives you your own brand image and halo. So there you go. Um, so there's that. Um, yeah, I just, I feel like at times they've tried to be like the muscle car. At times they've had some like performance, really like roided up cars. At times they've been like the really over the top style. Um, right now, I don't know what they are. And I, I will say this, it's a very candid interview. If you read it, I don't think you ever hear, you'd ever hear Ford say Lincoln is going to be Ford plus, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, to me in some ways that's almost like, Ugh, okay, but you know, there is, I think, a market for, <coughs> excuse me, premium cars. And I think sometimes if you're willing to sort of accept that and know that like, you know, maybe you're not going to be BMW, you're not going to be, you know, Bentley, you're not going to be in that like uber luxury space, you know, it's okay to be premium. And I think that's where brands like Infinity, Acura can sort of sometimes fit in. I think Cadillac based on its history, has higher aspirations. I don't think they're ever going to sort of accept being, like, premium. So there's that. But, um, you know, it could be a path forward for Infinity. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure on that one. It's really the article, in some ways, asks as many questions as it answers, which is, you know, how things are right now. Well, I mean, again, Lexus kind of like, you know, I don't know if you agree with this, Greg, but I kind of hold Lexus up as like the pinnacle of Japanese luxury. Um, like you, you could certainly make an argument that the ES is Toyota plus it's, you know, it's the same platform as, um, the Camry and Avalon. Um, and you know, it's differentiated enough that no one, like if you park them next to each other, you're like, okay, yeah, I see the hard points, blah, blah, blah. but, but like they're different. They're not the same vehicle. The same can be said of the RX, which for, you know, when it started out, um, when it's, when it charted its path in America, it was a version of a Toyota that, that they don't sell in the United States, but they sell elsewhere, the Harrier. Um, again, the RX was, was Toyota plus the, it's the same thing with the SUVs. The, um, the GX is. Um, you know, kind of like a mashup between a Forerunner and a Prado, um, which are both Toyota products. The LX is an, you know, a more luxurious version of the Land Cruiser. Um, and, and Lexus has some of its own unique products. Um, but, you know, you could make an argument that Lexus is Toyota Plus and, and they've made that work in a way that, um, the general public looks at them as kind of like the pinnacle Japanese luxury car. Um, and, and that works. Can, can Infinity kind of take that model and make it their own? I mean, the, the proof will be in the pudding. Um, they've just announced the strategy. It's way too early, early for us to like, you know, say it's a, a, you know, a good idea, a bad idea that it's a, um, a success or a failure. Um, but you know, like I, calling it Nissan plus sounds really derogatory, but it doesn't have to be that way. If they can truly make the cars different, feel different from behind, behind the wheel, look different in the showroom. 
it might be the path to profitability to keep infinity a going concern. Whereas if, if things go on now, it just won't be. Yeah, cool. Well, we can, I think we can leave it there other than to say that infinity is just, you know, they're, they're, they're facing some uncertainty right now. Um, so let's move along to a list you compiled. Uh, I kind of tease it out is the car that you're most likely to have the engine blow in it. Uh, maybe a more delicate way is to put powertrain problems. Uh, this is a new list, right? Brand new list you came up with. Uh, take us through it. Um, well, it's an interesting thing. Um, consumer reports, uh, you know, and you know, if, if you happen to be one of those people that thinks consumer reports is, is no good, um, and they have no value, then, you know, stop listening now. Um, if you can be rational, um, consumer reports does have value. Um, they've got thousands of subscribers, um, tens of thousands of subscribers. I don't know what their subscription base is. Um, and a really large percentage of them fill out their annual um, vehicle surveys and they get good, legit data. Um, and a lot of the vehicles that they came up with, um, you know, you're like, huh, that's interesting that that showed up there. But they didn't give um, any commentary um, or background behind the, the vehicles that they that they ran through. Um, I want you all to read the article, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say everything that was in there. Um, but the the vehicle at the very top of the list, I'll you know, spoil that one, was the Audi uh, A4 for a couple model years, model years with the uh, 2.0 um, T turbocharged four cylinder engine. Um, that's a super interesting uh, uh, vehicle. It's a premium German brand. Audi has a pretty strong reputation. Um, and here it is at the very top of the list for a couple model years is the vehicle most likely to suffer from a catastrophic uh, engine failure. Um, but they don't give any any information behind it. Um, so what we tried to do was um, we, we, of course, point back to consumer reports because, you know, they, it was their survey data that this is derived from. Um, but we try to give a little bit of background um, on on each vehicle as to why it might be the case. Um, the uh, Audi 2.0T, it turns out that there are several class action lawsuits that have been going on in the United States over that engine um, for timing chain problems, for excessive oil consumption. Those issues actually may be related. It turns out that um, that the Volkswagen Group, which Audi is a part of, um, designed this uh, timing chain tensioning system that relies on oil pressure and is just plain prone to failure. Um, it's the kind of thing that is, is like this, this new piece of technology that comes out and it's really cool. It sounds really cool, but you know, in, in the real world, they find out that after, you know, tons of hot and cold cycles, um, who knows what engine oil owners are using, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it's prone to failure. Um, other vehicles in there, you know, certain Ford uh, F-Series models with, um, with their own power stroke diesels. Uh, again, um, there's more information behind that that you may be interested in. Uh, it turns out a lot of the vehicles on the list are first model year. Um, well, that makes sense. The first time this vehicle came in, it needs some additional engineering work and it gets fixed in the second, third, fourth model year. Um, you, you might be surprised to see that there's an Acura on the list. Um, you know, Honda Acura has a, a reputation for um, ex excellent engineering, um, yet not everything that they make is gold. Um, every car company can have problematic vehicles, problematic components. Um, Acura has a history of, of transmission problems um, in, in certain vehicles. So, yeah, take a look at the list. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, some of the vehicles in there, you know, you know, you, you could say like, well, no one's going to expect that thing to be reliable. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, certain, you know, Chrysler FCA products, you're like, well, that's kind of a throwaway vehicle. Um, but other ones aren't, you know, and, you know, people buy Ford F series trucks to drive hundreds of thousands of miles with their diesel engines, pulling big loads. And to find out that, you know, they're, they're certain, certain models are liable to have their engines explode or grenade on you after a little bit of time, you're like, huh, 
that's something that I really need to know about if I'm, you know, shopping for a, um, a, a luxury diesel pickup truck to tow my camper. Um, so it was just really interesting. Um, and, and when you dive into it, you start to see patterns emerge, like, you know, first model year, only year that they offered that engine transmission combination, that kind of thing. Um, just it sheds a little bit of light onto the raw data. So this is a really cool list. Uh, thanks for doing it, Jeremy. I think, um, you know, rather than dissecting it, I think the best thing here is to just everybody check it out. Uh, head over to Autoblog. It's, uh, it's really cool, especially if you're in the market for a car. Um, you kind of want to know these things. So be sure to check that out. Uh, and that wraps up our news segment. Now we're going to segue over to an interview uh, I did with Frank Meekham. Uh, he talks about some really interesting uh, Shelby Mustangs uh, that he's got coming up. They're part of a special collection. And also, he's going to touch on how do you do an auction in the age of coronavirus. So, hint, uh, a lot of hand sanitizer. So, uh, let's have a listen. Joining us now on the podcast is Frank Meekham of Meekham Auctions. Uh, Frank has a big auction coming up uh, in July in Indianapolis. Uh, we're excited to talk about that and some of the things that uh, Meekum is going to try to sell. It's a pretty cool auction. And if you've never been to an auction, whether it's Meekum or any of the you know many other auctions out there, auction houses, they're a really cool thing. I've been to a few of them. If you're an enthusiast, it's a great way to get you know somewhat up close and personal with the cars. If you're obviously a buyer uh, who's also an enthusiast, it's a great place to, you know, sort of shop for your next purchase. Uh, it's really, it's really a lot of fun. So Frank, thanks for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Okay. Uh, so big, uh, big news for you guys is this auction coming up, uh, like I said, in July in Indy. Um, some of the lots that really caught my eye were these uh, Shelby's. Very cool. Rare prototypes. The GT350 Paxton, very cool. There's a GT350R in there. Uh, just, I know a lot of our listeners really are into cars like this. Why don't you kind of take us through, uh, you know, how you think these cars are going to do and what makes them so special? Well, those, those cars are coming out of the John Otzbach collection, which is uh, the best Shelby Mustang collection that we've ever offered. Uh, every one of his cars is elite, uh, best of the best. Uh, when I was talking to people, when they're asking questions about them, uh, uh, wanting to know about them, the way I explain it is each one of his cars would be the cornerstone of most people's collection. So to have an opportunity to offer this to the public is a big deal. And when we when we get to Indy in July, it's gonna be uh, it's it's gonna be a great auction and should set some records. Very cool. The one of the ones that really has me excited is the one that's the first R model, the 1965 Shelby GT 350R. First, you know, again, like I said, first our model built. Uh, just take us through a little bit, kind of dig deeper into that one. I think that's really cool. Well, the the car you're talking about is the Ken Miles Flying Mustang, and it's it's the most famous R model out there. It's got the most provenance. It's a factory race uh, Shelby race car. So it's, it holds all the records, the championship car. It's the, if you go through it and start reading the history on the car, it's just, you just see one after the other, best of the best, uh, with the provenance, the names behind it was Shelby, Ken Miles, uh, and all the wins that the car had. Um, it's just a real big deal. And when it, uh, crosses the auction block, it's gonna, it's gonna, create a lot of attention. Very cool. Very cool. Um, what else is coming up in this auction? Obviously you talk about the Shelby's. Our readers love um, Shelby Mustangs, things from that generation. Uh, really a Shelby of almost any stripe. Uh, but tell us about some of the other lots that are intriguing and things you guys have uh, coming up to cross the auction block. 
Well, the great part about uh, any Mecham auction is you're going to find, uh, especially Indy, it's going to be 10 days over 2,000 cars. You're going to find things for everybody. You're going to have cars that are going to be in that entry level collectible uh, 10 to $20,000, and then you're going to have the big seven figure cars. So you're going to have something for everybody. Uh, what I like to tell people about Mecham auctions, it's it's the best car show you've ever been to. And then with the live action of the auction, just, just sets it, sets it off. You know, I've, I've been to a few auctions during my time of the business and, you know, it's, it's exactly like that. It's really something that, you know, it's hopefully, you know, we can move beyond this, you know, the pandemic and it's, you know, you can get out to some of these events. They're really cool things to experience because just you're so up close with these cars that, you know, maybe you've only seen, you know, an auto blog or in your favorite magazine, or just, you know, maybe you had that sort of hot wheel when you were a kid. It's really cool to get up close. And, you know, a lot of auctions, the cars will drive onto the block. So you do get that kind of brief burst of like exhaust and like engine noise. It's, it's certainly cool. So, so speaking of the pandemic, you know, we are, you know, still sort of at it, sort of kind of coming out of it. Uh, we're recording this um, in early June, and Michigan's stay-at-home order was literally just lifted yesterday. Um, what What are you guys doing as far as like making this auction safe? And tell me about some of the challenges that it's gonna, you know, that all of this entails. I got to believe there's a lot that goes into these things. All oh, the ch the challenges of this uh, this summer is is going to be a lot, but we're 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 set for the challenge. Uh, we've we've created a lot of new systems for our auctions. Uh, that we never thought of that we were going to have to have. Uh, but with the times, we've, we're have we going to be spacing people out in the auctions. We're going to be creating new ways for people to bid. Um, we're going to make sure that uh, that our customers are safe. And we're choosing venues um, that we are able to control and keep everybody safe and still have the environment people have come to expect from a Mecham auction. Um, we're also going to be um, – we're going to be – pushing hard this summer with all the moves we've had to made. Um, but we're going to come out of this uh, better than ever. Um, that's We're looking for a great summer and getting back on track and uh, getting getting people back to to the the car hobby that we all love. Um, so we can start uh, so we can start pushing forward. With plenty of hand sanitizer, too, I'd imagine, right? Uh, yep, hand sanitizer, and you know we'll have we'll have face masks on site. We'll have uh, temperature checks, and we'll be spacing out the bidders. They, you know, we won't have people sitting on top of each other. We'll be spacing out cars, and, and we'll be creating a environment that is going to be uh, uh, safe for everybody, but uh, still going to be a, a normal, exciting Mecham auction with uh, with the live action. Cool, very cool. Now to kind of take a step back just from the moment, but to look, look at just, you know, the auction sector, what like eras of cars do you see doing well right now? Are you seeing an interest in a certain time period or a certain, you know, style, whether it's like the muscle car era or, you know, as, you know, sort of people, Gen X has aged, we're seeing, you know, really, you know, a lot of interest in like eighties and nineties cars. I mean, is there a, like a genre to put this in a musical term that seems to be getting a new, you know, source of interest. Uh, there's, there's always new sources of interest and new, uh, genres to use the word, uh, that come available and, and, and start to start to, uh, become popular. But the one that I've seen over the last uh, two years that, um, has gone, uh, a lot further than I thought it was going to go are that is the uh, Bronco and uh, Blazer market it just absolutely on fire. Uh, who thought uh, even five years ago that you're going to see $150,000 and $200,000 Broncos? It's, uh, it's crazy times, really, when it comes to those. I mean, it certainly helps that, you know, Ford is bringing back the Bronco. Uh, we're seeing this somewhat, you know, related, if you will, like those stories on site always do really well. It's not just the new Bronco, it's the old Bronco. And it's like values, it's, you know, even retro drives, things like that. So, you know, it's really an interesting time to be a collector because obviously all the really old stuff is there. If you want to go back to like, 
you know, the gaslight era or something, those cars are still out there getting rare and rare, but this new stuff, stuff that frankly, maybe for some of us wasn't even considered collectible, you know, like Broncos were not a rare item for me growing up in Michigan, you know, so it's kind of cool to see the evolution of the hobby. No, it's 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 a uh, neat market that's getting pushed uh, by the younger generation as we see more uh, uh, people that are becoming in their 40s and 50s uh, and late 30s. Uh, they got a little different interest than than the uh, than the older hobbyist, and it's it's showing that this market is going to stay strong for a long time, and it it makes it uh, exciting. Very cool, very cool. Is there any? Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier, like there's a lot of cars in the twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar range. I think a lot of people they watch an auction on TV, and you see the ultra rare, you know, Duesenberg or you know, sixty eight Charger or something going for big dollars. But that's sort of like almost like the maybe the, you know, unspoken part of some of these auctions is you've got like $20,000 to spend, which is, you know, less than the average price of a new car in this, in this country, which I think the last I saw was like 37,000. Uh, you could go get yourself something that could be anywhere from like a daily driver to a collectible. Like there's a bunch of different things you could do with that kind of money. If that's how you want to use your money as an enthusiast. Um, what kind of opportunities do you see in that space, I guess? Oh, there's there's plenty of opportunities. Just thinking off the top of my head, uh, uh, you, you can go Fox Body Mustang um, or, or go to the, the tried and true, the most uh, probably one of the most popular collector cars ever and still to this day, uh, a 65 Mustang uh, in that $25,000 range is, is a great collector car. Um, and for uh, what I tell people, it's, it's always a good bang for the buck. Uh, look at a C5 Corvette. Um, that's another car that's, that's a lot of fun and, and not a lot of money. You're, you're talking high teens to 30000 for for a C5 Corvette and getting great value. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Frank, thanks for joining us today on the Autoblog Podcast. Good luck with the auction. Uh, stay safe and be well. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me on. All right. So thanks for joining us, Frank, again. Uh, good to catch up. Uh, and that's all the time we have this week. Jeremy, uh, enjoyed hanging out with you. Uh, summer's happening in Ohio. What are you doing, man? What are you doing this weekend? Um, tons of yard work. We've been doing every, everything we can to get our grass looking nice. We're transplanting a bunch of you know, flowers and, and plants. I've put a vegetable garden in. Um, so yeah, probably lots of gardening on my uh, agenda this weekend. I think I'm going to do some grilling. Uh, not sure what, but I've grilled chicken, burgers, and a few other things. Steaks all in the last week. It's just that time of year. So. It is totally that time of year. I've been doing some grilling. I've uh, my wife and I in this coronavirus pandemic time have been binge watching uh, past seasons of MasterChef. Oh, nice. So I've, yeah, I've been I've been trying some of their uh, you know pan frying uh, steaks and pork chops and you know covering them in butter and all this kind of stuff. I've been I've been experimenting that way too, but of course you know it's hard to beat a grill sometimes too. I made the uh, grilled chicken last uh, uh, last last weekend. It turned out excellent. Grilled chicken on the grill can't beat that. Uh, exactly. and you also can't beat the Autoblog podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, Frank, thanks for joining us. Jeremy, thanks for co-hosting. Everybody be safe out there. We will see you next week.